Hi, it's Christy Robillard for Virtue, and I've been asked to share a few thoughts on Philippians chapter three. And I do have to say, not only is it my privilege, but I'm excited to share on one of my life chapters. Philippians chapter three is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. It's one of those chapters that I go to when I want perspective and when I want comfort. And it really is a pivot point in this entire letter to the Philippians. He turns to his own personal testimony. And as Paul stated, he, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, he was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Uh, he was a Pharisee and not just a Pharisee, but he was a zealous Pharisee, so much so that he actually ravaged the church of Jesus Christ. He would take men and women and bind them and take them into prison because that's what he thought his religion wanted him to do. Religion, for the sake of religion, can get us into so much trouble and worse than that. When I read this chapter, I can't help but think of my husband's uh, Aunt Sally, who um, is now, I believe, with the Lord for quite a while, but we loved Aunt Sally. She was a very religious woman. She was a woman who went to church every day. She took communion and uh, said her confession weekly. Uh, she served in her church. She did so much in regards to religion. And she was a very sweet and kind woman and we loved Aunt Sally very much. But what she shared with my husband on more than one occasion is she said, I wish I had your confidence. I wish I had your confidence that I was gonna go to heaven. And here Aunt Sally was approaching 80. In fact, I think she was actually on the other side of 80 when she said these words, still serving, just a beautiful woman. But all of her religion, all of her duty did nothing for her to gain the confidence that she would go to heaven. That is so sad. And we would share with her from chapter three, using Paul's own testimony. And, and she would say, I wanna believe that. I don't know why it was so hard because she believed the Bible was God's inspired word. I don't know what that hurdle was inside of her that she wasn't willing to jump. But we thank God that we have this very word right here that tells us religion is not your ticket into heaven. Paul's very own words, and, and I would just summarize his testimony in this way from this very chapter, verses eight and nine. Gain Christ and be found in him. That is Paul's testimony. And that was his assurance that he would go to heaven and spend eternity with the Lord. Paul talks about rejoicing in the Lord. He says, it's important for me to remind you of these things. And so when we're experiencing pain and suffering, and I know many of you are, he says, rejoice in the Lord because he talks about suffering, the loss of all things in his testimony. And he even alludes to it in chapter two, where he talks about Epaphroditus, his brother in the Lord, his faithful soldier, and how he was sick to the point of death. And he said, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul did experience great tribulation, great hardship, and real losses. Now the losses that he counts as rubbish that he talks about in Philippians chapter three are those religious boxes that he had ticked off. You know, all of those things that he put confidence in before, all of those things that caused him to be zealous and actually bring Christians into prison. He says, you know what? Not only is it nothing, and not only is it not gonna get me where I wanna go, it's not gain, he says, but I count it as rubbish for the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. 
all of those other things, they meant nothing. And praise God that he was encountered on that Damascus road and had a dramatic conversion. And in that conversion, it's actually in uh, recorded in Acts chapter nine, Ananias was told in a vision that there's a man named Saul. He was named Saul before he became Paul. And he said, he's, he's gonna come to you and he, he's gonna be a chosen servant of mine and I will show him what things he must suffer. So why, why was Paul going to be a man who suffered so much? Why do you suffer? Why do I suffer? Suffering is a tool that the Lord uses in many believers' lives to grab our attention. You know, I like to say grabbing us by the scruff of our neck, but it grabs our attention and it causes us to lean into him and to look to him, to press in to him. And in Paul's suffering, he says in verse 10, he says that I may know him. Now this is a prayer of Paul's, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that I may attain to the resurrection. In 1995, as I was reading, and, and really it was in 1995 that I, I really uh, spent a summer in Philippians chapter three. The Lord just, just had me in that chapter and he would not release me. It you know just was ministering to me so deeply and, and I felt inspired to make that verse, verse 10, one of my prayers. And I recall praying, that I may know him. Yes, I, I want to know you, Lord. I want to continue knowing you. The power of your resurrection. Yes, I want to know the power of your resurrection. And then I would feel the breaks kind of come on as I would pray obediently and the fellowship of your sufferings because I didn't understand what that meant. I, I felt like in some way I was, I was praying to have suffering, but that's not it at all. The word fellowship is the word koinonia in the Greek. It's, it means close, intimate fellowship in the midst of suffering. It's, it's not just partaking, but it's having fellowship with Jesus Christ in the midst of your suffering. See, we can suffer or we can have fellowship with Jesus Christ in our sufferings. And that's really the word that I would strongly encourage each of you to consider and even to pray, you know, to pray verse 10 as I did. You know what? God's He's not going to do anything that he doesn't want to do. We're not going to coerce him and we're not going to mess up the plan <laughs> by praying such things. But we might just get into the rhythm of the Holy Spirit and what it is that he's doing and working in and working out of us. That power of the resurrection is at work in our very lives in this day that we're living day to day, it is at work. And maybe you're saying, where is that resurrection power? I don't feel it. All I feel is the suffering. All I feel is the pain. That's where you stand in faith. And you know that the power of the resurrection is working. It's just not working in the way that you think it's working. God's economy is completely different than our own. This is not as good as it gets. Praise God. Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. We have heaven to look forward to, not only when we die, but that's where our citizenship is right now. And that is our perspective as we go through each day you know, even in our pain and our suffering, that we have our citizenship, which is signed and sealed and already delivered in heaven. And what I love is he says that he will transform 
the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, verse 21. That gives me great joy too. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work to maintain our bodies, right? A lot of maintenance. There's gonna be a day that there's gonna be no more maintenance, maintenance-free body, and it's gonna be wonderful because it's gonna be like his. We'll be transformed and be like him. So I really just hope that these words give you a perspective, that these words give you some comfort, and that really they give you encouragement. Just remember, keep it simple, gain Christ, and be found in him. God bless you.